May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. On this Mother's Day, I have a little parenting story for you. My son, Frank, is two. He just turned two last month. Um, and he's going through this developmental explosion. Those child, you child development people in the room know this. He is getting new vocabulary every day. He's gaining new social skills. He is out and about developing his personality. And maybe this is typical for a two-year-old, but maybe this is because he is a double priest kid. But at two, he is also learning how to pray. So this is one of the big social developments in our house. And most recently, Frank has started interrupting our grace at meals with his own prayer petitions. And at first, I thought he just had really strong opinions about our usual Johnny Appleseed grace that we pray, the one I learned in Girl Scout camp. But I realized he wasn't saying Appleseed when he was interrupting the prayer. He was saying the name of one of our close friends in the neighborhood, whose name also starts with an A. He was interrupting our formulaic grace to insert his own petition to pray for our friend. And he would get really frustrated if we did not stop the song to pray for her um, so much that he would throw his plate. You know, it meant a lot to him. It was very clear. Um, and I think friendship was important to Frank for a reason, because friendship is precious. Friends are indeed worth praying for, worth giving thanks for. Now Frank has been wanting to pray for his friends and in that kind of long wordy gospel we heard today from the Gospel of John, we hear Jesus praying for his friends too. It's a little piece of John that we get this kind of window into Jesus's prayer life, into his relationship with God, into his relationship with his friends, those disciples who are following him on the way. And friendship with the disciples is what Jesus is praying for, but I think by extension, he's praying for us too, us disciples here in 2,000 years later. And I think this theme is really important and worth talking about today because Friendship in the New Testament is a metaphor for discipleship. It's, as many of you know, it has its own Greek word for the type of love that's shared between friends, phileo. It has a kind of fondness in that meaning. It has a sort of affection, a warmness that exists between the people who choose to be in loving friendship together. And we might not get to choose who our parents are, or we might not get to choose our siblings, but... Our friends are the kinship networks that we get to choose for ourselves. And so this gift of friendship can transcend all social barriers, right? If we are intentional, our friendships can cross divisions of race or class or age or gender. And so I think friendship can be a particular window into what liberated life in the kingdom can look like. I think sometimes we imagine friendship to be shallow, right? It's easy, as Jesus says, to love the people who love you. It's easy to like the people who like the same things that you like. But I think Jesus calls us to a deeper understanding of friendship and discipleship. So I want to thicken up our own impressions of friendship because, as Jesus says also in the Gospel of John, I do not call you servants any longer. I call you friends. So this idea is really key to how Jesus understands what the church is called to be. Dean Cynthia Kittredge has said in her commentary on John's gospel that Jesus' example makes his friends to be the friends of God. And John's opening in the prologue even describes this when he says God comes to take on flesh and blood and dwell among us. That sense of companionship, God chooses to be with us as a friend is with us in our moments of need. God takes on flesh and bones so that he can understand our tragedy and our sorrow, as well as our joy and our love. And I think God's friendship is not the shallow friendship we might expect. It's a deeper friendship that helps us understand all of our own friendships in a new light. It's the friendship of the self-emptying cross. It's the friendship that let wine overflow at a wedding 
It's the friendship that held dinners in countless people's homes, dinners of tax collectors and sinners, not just dinner tables of the righteous, right? And then our friendship with Christ looks like the table at Bethany in the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. It looks like offering up two little fish and some loaves on a hillside that turns into an incredible picnic. Our friendship with Jesus looks like pouring out expensive anointing oil and wiping it away with tears. Jesus' friends show us what discipleship can look like. Now, have any of you heard of the social theory tend and befriend? We have any psychologists in the room? I was familiar with our usual responses to stress that I had been taught. Flight, fight, freeze, right? Um, but more recently, uh, when some of these initial studies were redone to include more women in the sample size, a couple other trends began to be seen, specifically things they're calling tend and befriend. Tending, being a response to danger or to stress, which means to care, people will go and care for the vulnerable, often children, right, in these stressful situations. Or befriend, when you're experiencing crisis or stress, you gather people around you, you call in your friends to come and sit with you, keep you company. And I think this beautifully illustrates Jesus' own friendships, perhaps our own discipleship. At Jesus' most stressful time in his life, it's his friends who show up to tend and befriend him. It's the women who stay at the crucifixion, watching and waiting. It's the women who show up early on Easter morning with the spices and the ointments to tend to Jesus' body. And it's the women, it's Mary Magdalene, who show up and proclaim the good news to the other disciples of the resurrection. Their friendship, their acts of friendship, are discipleship. And it's those first women disciples who I think help shape the church in profound ways. So as we listen to Jesus praying for his friends in our gospel today, I hope we can expand our imagination to include those women disciples as well, to include you all here in the room, because he prays that we will be in the world, but not of the world. And in the Gospel of John, the world is coded language for a way of being, a way of being that sows cynicism and discord, a way of being that thrives on division and hatred, a way of being that keeps us apart by denigrating the humanity of others. And in that coded language of John, I read what Jesus is praying for to mean that he hopes we can create this radical community of friendship, where love invites us to cross every barrier, to respond to crisis, tending and befriending, to be places of where the virtues of unity and charity and forgiveness are lived and practiced. That being set apart, being sanctified, means being set apart for love. Friends, I think the forces of the world, as John would say it, are strong. Because so often in our life, the world feels like it's burning lately, right? From Rafa to Donetsk, from college campuses to Flint, Michigan, that still doesn't have drinkable water, through the hailstorms we just experienced and tornadoes, the extremes of hurricanes and weather, the evil one prowls around like a lion, right? Seeking someone to devour, as our Compline liturgy says. So perhaps friendship with God is the one thing we can count on in this world. Perhaps the church is the place where we learn how to befriend, how to tend, and how to live in a friendship that transforms and calls us to live in love. We saw you all doing just that only 48 hours ago when suddenly out of nowhere, people just appeared here on the campus to take care and to tend to this place, taking down trees, helping clean up after the storm. Yesterday, we saw you do this as you came and you offered blood, caring for those who are vulnerable among us. 
And today, I see you celebrating those who we're going to recognize at Recognition Sunday, a true act of friendship, celebrating and living into that virtue of celebration that we're called to as resurrection people. In all things, I think today our gospel invitation is to reimagine Jesus' mission among us as a mission of friendship. Friendship that lifts up the vulnerable. Friendship that doesn't gatekeep who is in and who is out of the kingdom. Friendship that chooses to be a companion on the way. Friendship that prays for one another as Jesus prays for us. And like we tell our kids, to have a friend, you have to be a friend. And thanks be to God for Christ, who chooses to befriend us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.